So we're going to continue with our series from Malachi. We're going to start chapter 2 tonight. And the title is Accursed Priests. So we've been looking at the book of Malachi, and thus far we've seen that God speaks to his people and that his fundamental message to his people is, I have loved you. Chapter 1, verse 2. God has loved his people from eternity past when he chose us to be saved and to be his, even though we did not deserve anything from him but judgment. Yet we see that we have also failed to love God in return, especially as demonstrated in our dead worship, our lack of respect and honor for God. Unacceptable, formalistic worship with no heart in it. As God's people saved by grace, chosen in grace for a special relationship with God, we should be zealous for God, zealous to know God, zealous to love God, zealous to obey God, and zealous to worship God. It is the only reasonable response to God's work in our life of regeneration. It's the only reasonable response to God's great salvation and the relationship gift he gives us Uh, in the relationship with himself that we now enjoy by faith in Jesus Christ. But like these Israelites, we too grow complacent. We grow lukewarm. We lose our first love. We begin to take God for granted. We get used to it. And so suddenly my salvation doesn't seem so amazing. It seems like, well, it just kind of always was the way. And through that uh, mostly passive, mostly subtle process, we somewhat unthinkingly begin to show contempt for God and contempt for his worship. And that is a dangerous business. For when we fail to bring proper heart love and heart worship to God, he declares a curse on us. Malachi 1, 14. So here in chapter 2, God focuses his all-seeing eye on the priests. Up till now, the message has largely been directed at the people of Israel, although, of course, the priests are included within that, and some of their actions are even uh, criticized in chapter 1. But the focus really now turns to the priests, the pastors of that time, the big-shot religious leaders, those who would stand above, literally and figuratively, And instruct God's people. Now, maybe those regular people of God could forget about God, could lose their heart worship of God. But surely not these priests. They go to the temple every day, uh, once a year even. One of them gets to go into the most holy place. They're surrounded by God all the time. Surely they will not fall into that same trap of dead, formalistic, empty worship. But as we will see, they surely do. Malachi chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And now this admonition is for you, O priests. If you do not listen and if you do not set your hearts to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse on you and I will curse your blessings. So we see at least from chapter 1 that priests are not above God's expectations and demands. And we see that priests, like everybody else, are subject to curse. And verse 2 continues, I have already cursed them, and I will curse their blessings, the blessings they give. And it's a severe curse as laid out in verse 3. Because of you, addressing these priests, because of you, I will rebuke, cut off your descendants. I will spread awful on your face from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it, carried off like the trash. This is our text tonight, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So the first point I want to make is pastors are held to the highest standard. It is a great honor to stand before God and minister to God's beloved, his flock. Pastors, are told, are, we are told, are God's gift to his people, Ephesians 4, 11. It was he who gave some. Our job as pastors is to prepare God's people for works of service and to build up the body of Christ, Ephesians 4, 12, and 13. So you notice from this the the order of operations. God loves his people, 
God sees their need for help to be prepared and to be built up. And so God calls and equips pastors and teachers and so on for that purpose. See, it's not God loves the pastors and so he gave them some people. That's, God, that's backwards. No, God loves his people, and so he makes and gives pastors and elders and others for them. This should be a humbling point for all pastors, and it's this. We exist for you, not you for us. Now, it's true that the faithful ministers are due honor. In fact, double honor, it says in 1 Timothy 5, 17. It's true that they are to be respected and properly revered as God's agents who faithfully administer God's duties assigned to them, at least insofar as they do so. But we must remember that they are to be honored because of God and because of God's work in them and through them. It's not anything inherent in the pastor or the elder or whoever themselves. In a fundamental sense, pastors are no different than any other believer who've simply been called to a different office and a different duty for God. It is somewhat like the husband and the wife. They are equal in God's sight, But the wife must submit to respect and honor her husband in God's order, Ephesians 5, 22, and so on. So we must honor faithful pastors as God commands, but let's make sure we're honoring them as God commands, not as some superior beings or all-knowing persons. And if anyone is laboring under the misassumption that we are superior or all-knowing, I assure you it's not the case. But see, pastors can get into big trouble because you begin to think just like that. They begin to think, I am something because of my attributes or my achievements, rather than I am something because God called me to be that something. God equipped me to be that something, and he gave me a job to do. We see this around us, all around us in the church world. Pastors become famous. Perhaps they're good speakers, perhaps they're charismatic, perhaps they're whatever. So they become famous and they develop their mega churches and they go on their book tours and they suddenly, instead of becoming God's pastors, they become minor celebrities. And then they become proud and they become independent of God. And usually they become destroyed, destroyed in financial scandal, in adultery and other sexual immorality, or spinning off into their own conceited and concocted philosophies and ultimately to self-destruction. You can Google it. You can find so many examples of people who preach the word of God. They got a little taste of fame or whatever you want to call it, and they went bananas and lost their mind and were destroyed. Even some who've turned away from the basic faith that they used to preach. We are, of course, very fortunate to have had Pastor Matthew as the antitype to such unfaithful ministers. A man with many gifts, charismatic, speaker, author, all of that, but who was fundamentally committed to the will of God and fundamentally, fundamentally committed to shepherding the flock placed under him by God rather than running around chasing some kind of glory. But pastors can easily fall into that. Pastors can also easily fall into dead worship. You think about this. I never really just get to go to church. You ever think about that? I just go to work, right? I don't get to go to church once in a while. That's why Mr. Perry always taught me, be the first person to preach at the retreat. Then you don't have to do anything for the rest of the time. (laughs) I learned. I thought he was honoring me by putting me at the end. But he just knew this guy doesn't know the difference. Uh, But it's a rare thing that you get to go. Our worship can become dead and formalistic. It can become a job. It can become, okay, I've got to go to work, and I've got to make sure this happens, and that happens, and the other thing happens. And we can stumble into that self-importance. This is what seems to have happened to our priests in Malachi 2. Perhaps they were a little too close to the temple service and the worship, and it just became regular, and they got used to it, and they took it for granted. Whether they ever had it or not, they lost their heart for God. And it says in our text, they refused to honor him from the heart. They seem to have become very self-important, bringing their offerings and standing up in front of everybody and doing the whole thing. We don't know exactly what their problem was apart from 
uh, uh, their participation in this dead worship and their seeming contempt for God's worship, it's possible they became extremely wicked like Eli's presumptuous sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Remember, they stole from God his very offerings, 1 Samuel 2. They abused God's people to fatten themselves, and they slept with the women who served at the entry to the tent of meeting. So this is fornication, adultery, likely coerced or at least heavily pressured. It was all very dishonoring to God and very great sin in his sight. And this isn't just some regular person. This isn't even some regular Israelite. These are the priests that serve in God's temple, and they fell into this. They lost their heart for God, then they lost their regard for God, and they lost any fear of God. They are described uh, uh, like these people in Malachi, treating the Lord's offerings with contempt. That's what it says that Eli's sons did, 1 Samuel 2, 17. That's what it says that these priests did in chapter 1 of Malachi. Maybe they were like the sons of Samuel who did not walk in his ways but turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice, 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 3. We don't know exactly the nature of their problem, but we know that God rejected these priests in Malachi just as he rejected Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli. You remember their end. They were killed on the same day. Their family and their descendants were cursed there, uh, one of them had the son named Ichabod. It means no glory or glory departed, 1 Samuel 4. And the curse that God threatens upon the priests in Malachi is equally severe to the punishment that he weighed out on the priests in 1 Samuel. He says, verse 2 of our text, I will send curse upon you. It's reminiscent of the curse put upon Cain in Genesis 4. To be under God's curse is about as bad as it gets. It's a great loss. It's as great a loss as being under God's blessing is a gain for us. Curse means frustration. Curse means loss. Curse means difficulty. Curse means misery. And notice that God also gives a generational curse. In verse 3, because of you, because of your bad activities, I will rebuke, cut off your descendants. Now, that's pretty harsh, but it's pretty fair. God made a, general pro, a generational promise, after all, a generational covenant with the Levites, blessing them because of the actions of the Levites in Numbers 25 and perhaps also Exodus 32. And God had done the same in the family of Eli, uh, although they proved faithless. You remember 1 Samuel 2, 31, no longer will an old man in your family uh, be in your family line. They'll be cut off, they'll be blinded with tears, they'll be grieved, uh, and so on beggars. There is more, so it's just curse for you, curse for your offspring. The priest will be seriously dishonored because of their sin, because of their contempt, because of their dead, accursed worship. Verse 3, God says he will put the, the offal of the festival sacrifices on their face. Uh, if you read that text, it literally says he'll spread it across their face. If you don't know what the offal is, it's the waste left over from butchering a sacrifice. Now, we're pretty far removed, except for Mr. Swickard, uh, from butchering our sacrifices. But it's gross. It's filthy. It's unusable, unclean. It was to be burned and disposed of outside the camp. That's how foul the offal was, Exodus 29, 14. To have that spread on your face uh, or associated with you is a sign of disgrace, Nahum 3, verse 6. Imagine this sort of kidneys and intestines and leftover guts of the sacrificed animal, and then it's spread on your face. This would be a grave disgrace for any Israelite. It would make them unclean, but it's exponentially more so for the priests. Remember who these are. These are the big priests, high society. It's a hereditary office. You're, you're born into some uh, magical status as a priest. They're held in high honor by all the people, so much so that even when they behave dishonorably, the people still with fear and trembling uh, don't come against them. Uh, of the tiny few, the priests are of the tiny few that are allowed into the Holy of Holies once a year, uh, into God's uh, uh, presence in a different way. 
Priests were to avoid uncleanness at all costs. It's laid out in Leviticus 21. And yet here they are disgraced with the awful spread across their face. In verse 9 of our text, it says the priests will be despised and humiliated. That's a great disgrace. They're coming from a high height and they're going to a low, low. The point I'm driving at is that God's ministers are not above God's law. To the contrary, they are to be the most dedicated to God's will and God's word and God's law. They are to be the most obedient. They are to be the most careful. And they are to be the most worshiping God in spirit and in truth the most loving God from the heart, the most setting their heart on God, most eager and most zealous to honor and respect God. This idea is all over the Old Testament. There are special rules, special standards for them, and it's all over the New Testament as well. Titus 1.6, an elder must be blameless. I mean, if you ever thought you wanted to be an elder, just go read that and say, am I blameless? No, I can go home now. (laughs) The husband of but one wife, not divorced, not a philanderer, a man whose children believe and are open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Titus 1.7, since uh, an episcopos, an overseer, is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless. He must not be overbearing. He must not be quick-tempered. He can't be a drunk or a violent man. Verse 8 says he's got to be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And verse 9, he must hold firmly to sound doctrine. Now look, these are good standards, good uh, uh, attributes for every Christian to aspire to. But it says for the overseer, for the elder, for the pastor, these words are used somewhat interchangeably in the New Testament, it says they must be those things. Perhaps our political climate is turning that way, but it used to be that we had a higher standard for those in elected office. Now it seems you you get into high elected office, you're above the law. And it's easy to think that in the church. It's easy to think that in any institution. The opposite is true. We are held to a higher, in fact, the highest standard. We are not to become like Hophni and Phinehas. We are not to become like the Pharisees or these priests of Malachi or like so many of today's so-called star pastors. We are rather to be most humble, most obedient, and exemplary to the flock. The reasons for this are twofold. I mean, I guess the reasons are onefold. God said so, and that's the end of the story. But God gives at least two reasons for it. One, God's men must properly represent God, who is himself holy, pure, and good. Now, we're not going to ever reach God's standard, but we should be more reflective of God's standard. As teachers and governors of God's people, we are to build up and train up God's people. So how can we train them if we ourselves don't do it? So the first reason is we must be holy as God is holy. The second reason is you cannot train someone to do something that you can't do. Pastor Matthew would say you cannot give what you do not have. People will rightly regard us as hypocrites, making it all the more difficult to obey the word of God if we teach it, but we don't do it. I read this recently with all these climate people and somebody said, I'll start believing that there is a climate emergency when the people who claim that stop flying private jets and living in huge mansions. See, their actions belie their claims. They they show that they're not true. Even without the stumbling block of hypocrisy, we would be unable to teach what we don't ourselves do. So you're not going to listen to us because we're hypocrites, but even without that stumbling block, I can't convey to you how to do something that I myself don't really know how to do. Something that I've read about and something that I've internalized are very, very different. It's almost impossible to teach something that you don't understand or have some experience with. So God's priests are held to a high standard, the highest standard. Second, it is a heart standard. God has zero interest in mere externality. Matthew 9, 13, quoting the Old Testament, he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. 
This is the whole problem of these priests of Malachi 2. Lots and lots of sacrifices, smells and bells, but no heart for God. Empty, dead worship, so-called worship. Verse 2, if you do not set your heart to honor my name. You see, the heart, as always, is the problem. I am sure uh, that they did all the stuff, right? I am sure that they sliced up the stuff and they burned the fat and all they followed all the rules, this big book of rules, and I'm sure they followed it all. They even added many, many, many more rules to it. I'm sure they did it. I'm sure they had the bread and the oil and all of it. I'm sure they put it out every morning like they were supposed to and, and changed it and so on like they were supposed to. See, they did all the external things, but what's the problem? No heart. They are making all the sacrifices. In fact, if anything, uh, uh, that's an additional irritant to God, 1, 7, 10, and 13. They are giving the ironic blessings, standing there in all their big robes, making their pronouncements. But the problem is the heart. In fact, it says two times in chapter 2, verse 2. If you do not set your heart to honor me, and because you have not set your heart to honor me, when we look at our heart problem, we can have two different kinds of heart problem. The first is not born again. Everyone is born spiritually dead, and so everyone towards God has a heart of stone. Everyone is born against God. Everyone is born dead towards God, Psalm 2 and Ezekiel 36, 26. Until God moves in us and saves us and we cry out, Jesus, Lord, we cannot really set our hearts on God. At best, we can live in the perpetual state of frustration and conviction like the Romans 7 man. I want to do good, but I can't do it. I do it for a little while, but sin gets a hold of me. Wanting to do right, sometimes even able to do it for a season, but ultimately unable to sustain the moral reform, for they are slaves to sin. We need that new heart that God promises. Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, dead heart of stone, and, and give to you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That's what the spiritually dead person needs, to be made alive with a new heart by God. And notice the order. See, first comes the internal, new heart and new spirit. Second comes the external, follow my decrees and keep my laws. If we try to do part two before part one, it's not going to work because we are incapable. We will fail. See, the external matters, all right, but it only matters insofar as it's an accurate reflection of the internal, the spirit work of regeneration the internal heart desire to actually set our hearts on God. And see, this is the problem with these priests. It's all exterior, all outward, no inward, no interior. It's the problem of the Pharisees and the Sadducees of Jesus' time. Every rule, every little hoop they jump through, but no heart. I mean, there is the promised Messiah that you claimed to be waiting for forever. He's standing right in front of you, and you can't see it spiritually blind because no heart for God. It's the problem of the so-called orthodox churches, sacramentalist churches in our day. It's the problem of all legalists. And frankly, it's the problem of many church kids. I go to church, I wear the right length skirt, I say, hello, Mr. Roby, and do all the stuff, and therefore I'm born again. Well, I hope you do all those things, but that's not enough to save you. Where is your heart? And it's the problem of all those people, and it's the problem of many, many pastors as well. Exterior without interior. The form of godliness, but lacking in power. An empty so-called faith. And the result of that heartless uh, life, that, that fake life, uh, uh, Mr. Dan Benetti preached one time about the almonds, you know, they look, they're called blanks, I think, they look like almonds, they act like almonds, and then when you go and get them, there's nothing inside of the almond, it's just a, a blank, just an empty uh, shell. So it's the exterior without the interior, and I think Mr. Benetti's growers hate that, and God hates it too. See, the antinomian and the profligate wants to claim the interior change without the exterior change. 
But the empty-hearted, self-identified Christian often wants to do the exterior without the interior. And it's a no in either case. God says interior change that results in exterior change of life. See, the interior and the exterior are fused together. We tried to slice it to, to make the indivisible divisible, but it doesn't work. They're fused together, inextricably intertwined. See, without the interior, we cannot change the exterior. With the interior, we cannot help but change the exterior. Exterior only cannot persist without interior change. And I think most likely our priests described here in Malachi 2 fit that category, not born again. But if you conclude that that's you, then the solution is not to mope or not to go off to sin as though somehow your status as unredeemed is a license to sin freely. Well, if God wanted to save me, he would have saved me, but he didn't save me, so I must be permissible to sin. If God wanted me to get to work, he would miracle me to work. I don't have to get up and brush my teeth and take a shower and get in the car and drive to work every day. No, no, the Lord wanted it. He would make it happen. No, no, there's divine sovereignty, but there's human responsibility to act on God's promises and to work out what God is working in. But this argument is an old argument that God didn't save me, so I'm justified in doing what I wanted. No, no, no. You will pay for every sin. Jeremiah 31, 20, Romans 6, 23, and 14, 12. The solution, if you find yourself with heartless worship, if you find yourself with no heart for God, the solution isn't to say, well, that's the way it goes. The solution is to cry out to God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The solution is to seek Jesus Christ and to trust in him alone for your salvation, for the forgiveness of sins, and to go bang down his door like the persistent widow. And he doesn't require you to knock too many times. In fact, what you'll find out is that knocking was him, not you. There is some mystery, of course, to the how God works all these things out. But there is no mystery as to what God will do if you cry out to him. He will save you. He will redeem you. Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. John 6, 37. Whoever comes to me, I will not turn away. So don't play the game blaming God for your lack of faith. Well, I wanted to believe, but God, you know, God's promises just didn't work out for me. And then conclude that now I'm justified in going to sin because God didn't save me. See, it's his fault. It's God's fault that I sinned because he didn't save me. No, no, no. As I said, there's divine sovereignty and there is human responsibility. You sin because you like it because you want it, because you decided to love your sin more than God. The argument, we get this argument every couple of years, it's transparently lame. Look at what God says. God invites you to come to him. He doesn't need anything from us. We need from him. But he graciously invites us. He graciously calls us. He graciously says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. He invites us to come to him. If you don't come to him, don't conclude that his invitation wasn't good enough. Conclude that you and your wickedness reject him. And then cry out to God and be willing to forsake your sin. And he will forgive you. It's guaranteed. See, you're without excuse before God. He said he will do it and he will do it. So the first heart problem is not born again. But the second heart problem is backslidden. And sometimes it can be hard to tell uh, which one of these, we, we, which category we're in when we're sinning. I was speaking to someone earlier and I said, we, we're probably on least sure footing when we are analyzing our own spiritual condition. We may overdo it and say, I'm better than I actually am. Or we may underdo it because we're familiar with all our sin, all our struggle, and all, all of our anxiety. Don't trust your own self-diagnosis. Instead, go to God and God's people. But you may be backslidden and just caught in sin, as Mr. Job preached last week. You made a profession, Jesus Lord. You got baptized. You meant it at the time. But now you find yourself caught in sin. What's the solution then? Is it to stay in your sin and conclude that you're not born again? No. 
It, the solution is repent. Proverbs 28, 13, confess and renounce and find mercy. That's what people don't want to do. Why? Because they want to hold on to my sin. If I am very tactical, I might confess it without renouncing it. Get halfway there. Confess it, but don't renounce it. No, in order to find mercy, if that's what you want, confess it and renounce it and find mercy. But you find a lot of people don't want mercy, or at least they don't perceive their need for mercy. I like my sin, and I want to hold on to it. See, the reality is we are sinners and we all sin. Every one of us. Romans 3, 23. Do you ever ask yourself, what is wrong with me? Here I am, saved by grace. I mean, remember back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, God did this powerful work in my life. And, and we're going to celebrate this 50th anniversary. And we make fun of those people justly uh, because of their early hippie days. But... You know, God did all this change. God did all this saving in my life. And here I am 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, and I'm still committing what can only be described as very stupid, basic sins. Something must be wrong with me. And the devil can take that and begin to twist it. Yeah, something is wrong with you. Maybe, maybe you're not born again. Maybe your confession was false. That's not the solution. The solution to your sin problem is to repent. Even after we are saved and even after we confess Christ, he tells us we're still going to sin. We're simultaneously justified and yet sinners at the same time. We have a new nature and we're a new creation. That's real. But the old man is still there. Sin is still crouching at the door, ready to jump on us. And we're not perfect. And so we're going to fall into sin once in a while. But the solution is repent. The solution is put down your sin and cry out to God. And praise God, he is merciful and faithful to forgive us even then. He commands us to confess And he promises to forgive and to purify us. So if you think you're in the category of backslidden and caught in your sin as though you are some passive participant in it, get out of that way of thinking. You think, I can do something about it. I can do what God commands me to do. Confess and renounce and find mercy. And I can do it because God is the one who commands it. Don't blame God for your sin and don't blame him for your failure to repent. Don't delve into the mysteries of election or escape uh, uh, responsibility in hyper-Calvinism. Like, well, you know, God saves or he doesn't save. There's really nothing I can do about it. If if that were the case, we wouldn't need a Bible, right? Maybe maybe we need a Bible that says there's a God. He may save you or not. We'll see you when you die. (laughs) Nothing else to know, right? He's going to save us or he's not going to save us. But that's not what he does. He gives us a responsibility He tells us to do things, and so he's going to enable and empower us to do that. So do what God commands if you're caught in sin. Repent, confess, and renounce sin. God will enable you to do it by grace. It can be scary. It can be embarrassing. It can be overwhelming to think about it. But you can do it. God will help you. Don't think that your newfound love for your sin and shaky conclusion that I was never saved will help you either, by the way. God will hold you to your covenant vows that you made to him. And I would also add, don't think that back to unregenerate is somehow some better place than uh, a backslidden Christian. It's it's not a good place. Not born again is a bad place. It's the worst place that you can be. Don't think that's somehow some good place to be. Even if that were true, even if, even if you really concluded, I, I think it can be hard to know, but even if you really concluded, boy, I think my profession was false. I think I wasn't born again. The solution is the same. Repent, cry out to God, trust in Jesus Christ, implore him to save you, and he will do it. And he's not going to do it because I said. He's not going to do it because you said. He's going to do it because he said, and his word is faithful. He's faithful to keep it. Sinning Christian, unregenerate Uh, a sinning pastor, regular congregant, whatever it is, the call of God is the same. Set your heart to honor God. This is the command and condition of Malachi 2.2. And because God commands it, it means we can do it. The great uh, uh, phrase from John Calvin, we, we repeat it all the time, but what God commands us to do in his word, he will enable us to do by his spirit. He didn't say what God commands in his word he will do for us by his spirit. He says he enables you. Then you have to get up and do it. 
We can do it. So how do we do it? What do we do? First, set your heart. This means decide, resolve, firmly commit. I will follow God. I will love God. I will honor God. Don't wait for some magical feeling of emotion to carry you along and sweep you into setting your heart on God. Does anything uh, uh, sound emotional about that? I will set my heart on God. That sounds militaristic, right? I set my heart on God. It's a decision of the will. So do it. Set your heart on God. I will live for God. Jesus is Lord, so I will obey him. Jesus is my Savior, so I will serve him in thanksgiving for his salvation. This is, in fact, what we all resolve and agree to do when we confess Christ as Lord. And it's what we publicly display when we get baptized. There's, unlike the sacramentalist churches, we don't believe there is any magical water that going in and coming out does anything by itself. It's an outward symbol. This is what happened to me. Died with Christ, buried with Christ, raised with Christ to live a new life with Christ. Wash clean of my sins in the blood of Christ. But it's all symbolic. It's meant to, to show outwardly what's happened to me inwardly. But we've got to decide. We've got to be firm. We've got to be resolved. We've got to do, as we sing at those baptisms, we've got to decide, I will follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Not shaky, not half-hearted, not conditional, not, well, I'll give it a try, but firmly resolved. Our heart is set on God. Like when Jesus said he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to do it, and I'm not going to turn away. That's the first thing. Second, having resolved, we've got to prepare to go and do that. We've got to put on the whole armor of God to protect us. It's all laid out in Ephesians 6. We've got to cultivate our own heart love for God by spending time with God, spending time in prayer with God, spending time in God's word, which tells us about God and through which we actually experience God as we read his word. The Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit wrote the word. The word is all about God. There's, there's something that happens when we read the word of God in faith that we begin to not just know about God, but know God in a different way. By fanning into flame the gift of the Holy Spirit, which he put in uh, us to dwell in us. Fan it into flame by our holy living and our desire for him. By our study of theology, not because theology is magical, but it helps us to understand the word. It helps us to make that word more clear. This word's been around for a long, long time, and so we can study what have other pious and learned people said about this, and it, and it builds me up, and it gives me a greater understanding, more love for God. By meditation on God, making him the object of our heart, what you think about, what you read about, what you spend your time doing. You can, you can cultivate that love for God, or you can cultivate that love for something else. Prepare by taking captive every thought and setting our hearts and minds on things above. Colossians 3, verse 2. Prepare by learning and by coming under others in discipleship. The first thing that happens when you join the military, they don't send you off to war. They send you to some kind of training. And that's just basic training. And then they tend to send you to some kind of other training so you can learn your specialty. It's the same thing for Christians. When God... Uh, uh, saves us and brings us out of the world, he puts us under others, spiritual drill sergeants, uh, to teach us and to train us how are we going to do this thing that God has for us to do. We prepare to love God and set our heart on God by developing our God-given minds through education. God gave us intelligence. He wants us to develop that intelligence through education he wants us to develop the ministry gifts that he's given us. Everybody has some ministry gift. Maybe it's serving, maybe it's preaching, maybe it's something, something else in the spectrum. But God gives us those gifts and he wants us to develop those gifts, discover and develop. In other words, I'm simply talking about training for the race, as Mr. Josh Morjohn preached at the retreat this past summer. So we've got to resolve We've got to prepare. And then third, we've got to do it. Just do it. Having committed, having resolved, having prepared, do it. 
Let your outside reflect your inside. Set your heart on God and then do the next right thing and the next right thing and the next right thing. And you'll see when you string together a lot of right things in a row, not only do good things happen for you, but you find when that heart that you set on God is firmer and firmer and firmer for God. And when you sin or fail, which everybody does, then confess and renounce and then get back up and do the next right thing. And then lastly, how to set your heart on God, examine yourself and be examinable. As I said earlier, sometimes we're at our least competent when we are engaged in self-examination. Self-examination is good. You should do it. But we've got to do that. But we've also got to be examinable. Examinable especially by God, but examinable by others that God has placed over us for that purpose. So that we can make sure we've set our heart on God, but we don't start to drift away over time. We've got to come back and reset and reset and reset. If, if, uh, if we could picture our life for God as a long, straight path, I think what we'll find is over time, it doesn't look like this. It looks a little bit like this. A little meandering back and forth. A little to the right, a little to the left, a little to the right, a little to the left, hopefully not much back, hopefully a lot of forward, but it's, it's a little bit uneven, and we're not, we are trying to go the straight and narrow and down the plumb line, but we've got to realize, as fallen people, we're not going to nail it perfectly every time. And so we examine ourselves, and we allow others to examine us. We allow especially God to come behind us and say, not this way, that way. And I want to close by looking at uh, uh, what I would call from this text the rebuke of hope. This is a rough text. This is rough stuff in here. But despite all the rebuke, despite all the judgment, despite all their dishonoring of God, and despite all the dishonor that God heaps on them, sacrificial guts all over your face, despite all that dishonor of these unfaithful priests, this is ultimately a word of hope to them and for them. If you, did you notice the conditional language when we read it? Verse 2, if you do not listen. Verse 2, if you do not set your heart to honor my name. Continuing in verse 2 and 3, I will, I will, I will, I will, you will be. Now it's true that God's already meted out some punishment upon them. God's already uh, said he curses their blessings. He says, I have cursed them in verse 2. But what he's doing is giving them opportunity to repent, opportunity to change. Now you think, why should these people get any opportunity? These are the priests. These are the high people. They know everything. They go in the temple and they treat God's stuff with contempt. They've had their turn. Wipe them out and bring someone else in. That's not what God does. He's giving them an opportunity. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says, this is my admonition to them. Admonition is like a, like a warning. Like a, you better change or else. God, as we heard last Sunday morning, is in the restoration business. And his goal then and now remains the restoration of his people. All these severe threats, generational curse, awful on the face, all those things. Yeah, they're true. And they happened. But God's purpose is to awake and alarm them unto repentance. If he was going to just disgrace them, he would have done it. If he was going to just cast them out, he would have done it. But he gives the admonition. He gives the warning. He gives the, the grace whose threats alarmed them in order to permit them, to give them an opportunity to repent. See, in the end, 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, it says, God desires all people to be saved. In the end, God is great in love and rich in mercy, Ephesians 2. Now, he's perfectly just, he's perfectly wrathful towards sins and sinners. But God's heart is to save. God's heart is to restore. He is to, his heart is to show mercy even to these priests who have sniffed contemptuously at his offerings. And it's God's attitude towards those priests, and praise the Lord, is God's attitude towards us towards all sinners out there who continue to sin and heap up judgment on themselves every day. It's, I say often, it's so fortunate that I am not God, right? Because it would be all vengeance all the time and probably the whole place would be wiped out, right? 
But God's not like that. God is great in love and rich in mercy. And so with all these people going around sinning wickedly, mocking God, mocking God's name, yeah, he still has some people among those people. He's giving opportunity to repent. He's giving opportunity to save. God's attitude towards us is restoration. I said before, all God has done for us, and we still commit these boneheaded, basic sins, like not really sophisticated, subtle sins. I mean, we got those too, but, but just easy, red part of the bullseye sins that we know we shouldn't do. And then somehow, like, there we go again, right? Yeah, God does not smite us and wipe us out, uh, which would seem somewhat fair. Instead, he says, I'm offering you mercy again. Well, he might partially smite you and cripple you or, or give you a sickness or give you a big rebuke or whatever. But even that, it's the, the end goal of that is restoration to relationship with God and love for God. So I say take advantage of God's offer of mercy. It's going to cost you. You'll have to let go of your sin, but you will gain much, much more. And in case you didn't doubt it, we read it this morning, Psalm 66, 18. See, he's praying to God and his prayer is answered. And he says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, you would not have listened to me, wouldn't have heard my prayer. And that's true for us too. We've got to let go of that sin in order to receive what God has for us, his mercy. But what a trade, sin and its empty promises for life with God, life with God now and life with God in eternity. See, the solution to this heartless worship, to this dead worship, to this unacceptable worship is not to go away sad like the rich young ruler. It's to let go of your sin, to cast it aside, and to grab hold of Jesus Christ by faith with both hands. It is my admonition from God to you, just as it was Micah's admonition from God to Israel. Don't suffer temporal and eternal disgrace. So God was threatening these priests with. Don't do it. Choose life and live life with God even today. And really in closing, I want to say we are all priests of God. There's some extent to which we can analogize the, the office of priest and the office of a pastor and elder now. But the truth is that distinction is really wiped out. We are all priests of God. First Peter 2 verse 9. We are all specially chosen by God for that high, high honor. Don't show contempt for God's special honoring for you. Don't defile God's worship. Instead, do what God says. Honor him, receive every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, and set your heart on God. In fact, what he says is, set your heart to honor me. Let's make that our uh, our, our plan for this week, for this month, for this year, I'm going to set my heart to honor God and then I'm going to set my feet about doing it. God always honors those who honor him, 1 Samuel 2, verse 30. But see, the converse is also true and we see it in our text. Those who dishonor him will be dishonored. Why be swept away by continuing in evil, as 1 Samuel 2 25 says, why have generational curse? Why choose generational curse? Why choose awful on your face? Rather do as 1 Samuel 12, 24 says, be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Set your heart to honor him and then stand firm and let nothing move you. He will forgive you. He will restore you. He will receive you and he will bless you. Amen. Oh God, help us to set our hearts to honor you. If we're outside of you for those with hearts of stone instead of hearts of flesh, oh God, then change our hearts. And if we're inside of Christ, but we're backslidden, we're caught in our sins, then we pray, help us to cry out to you. Help us to let go of our sin and change our orientation that our hearts would be set to honor you, honor you in the heart, honor you from the heart, honor you with our actions. Pray, we pray, O oh God, that you will help each of us to do so by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.